Hello, and welcome to The Real Economy. I'm Darby Dunn, your moderator today, and we are live at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Washington, D.C. Panelists today, Neil Bradley, the Executive Vice President of the Chamber, and Joe Brusuelis, RSM's Chief Economist. Uh, so it's quite appropriate that we're in Washington, D.C. today, actually, because there is so much going on in Washington this week that could affect the economy and could affect businesses. And that's where I want to start with some of that fun stuff. Uh, one congressperson I saw on TV last night said, really, it's the week from hell. <laughs> <laughs> but let's try to be a little bit more optimistic than that and start with, um, so we've got different things going on. We've got uh, possible action on the infrastructure bill. But we've also got these kind of scary scenarios about the budget and the debt ceiling. Uh, I know you posted, I think, today about this, about the debt ceiling. If it's not raised, what effects it could have? And I'd like to talk to you about that and then what, what you foresee as happening in this scenario. Okay, well, unfortunately, that week from hell may be defined by a short-term crisis, somewhat similar to what happened in 2011, which culminated with the U.S. credit rating being downgraded. Now, if we opt to have a crisis, remember, this is a choice. This does not have to happen there's going to be an impact on the real economy and businesses and households are going to pay a price. Uh, essentially, even a short-term crisis could result in a 1% drag on overall growth and it puts at risk around 1.2 million jobs. But I am somewhat optimistic. My base case is that this doesn't happen, that at the last minute they come to an agreement. But it's rational that we now begin to think through what the impacts of it are and if you're out there and you work in, say, finance, you can already see positioning at the front end of the Treasury curve, mm -hmm. especially around that late per period of late October, where there's been sort of a, a buyer strike mm -hmm. on purchasing government debt. These are things you're going to begin to hear as we inch up against the September 30th date, when I think we formally kick off what could be a, a month of crisis. So I read one, uh, an economist, I believe, he thought there was a one in five chance of this worst case scenario happening, still too serious for his comfort zone. You're a veteran of Washington. Um, how do you see this playing out? Yeah, you know, I, I don't think the, the risk is zero. I, I'm not sure it's 20% either. Mm -hmm. So I, I think if you play this out, um, Thursday, uh, the, the end of the month marks the end of the fiscal year. Um, both sides have already said that they're going to do a bill to keep the government open and keep it funded. The real crisis is what Joe alluded to, and this is the hitting the debt limit. Uh, based on current Treasury estimates, we're going to hit the debt limit third to fourth week of October, which means we're going to spend the next three weeks really arguing over how to, to raise the debt ceiling. And interestingly, no one's arguing over substance. No one's arguing. This is not a decade ago like the 2011 when it was an argument over fiscal policy. This is a pure a political argument about whose votes are going to be required mm -hmm. between Republicans and Democrats to pass it. I think we get through this uh, by using some procedural mechanisms that the majority party has available to us. But I think the picture it paints for the future is particularly troublesome. So we may skate by this time, but every time we do this, we get closer and closer to the time in which we won't skate by and we are going to have that economic impact that Joe talked about. Yeah, I mean, it seems like uh, the economy got through Delta OK with a passing grade, but there are a lot of risks that lie ahead. And this just seems to be adding to the list of risks, what's going on. Um, let's talk about infrastructure, because there could be some action on that this week. Get us up to speed on what's going on here in Washington, D.C., and how that can impact businesses. So uh, last night, Sunday evening, the Speaker announced uh, that the House would vote on the infrastructure bill on Thursday. So later this afternoon, they'll actually start debate on it. They'll have the vote on Thursday. If the vote passes, the bill goes to the President's desk, he signs it, and the $1.2 trillion infrastructure bill 
becomes law. So this is the $1.2 trillion bipartisan bill that's already passed in the Senate, and now we're just waiting for a House That's action. exactly right. I think the question is, is does it pass? And so, uh, interestingly, on the Democratic side, you have progressives who are uh, withholding their votes because they want to see it attached to the $3.5 trillion broader kind of social spending and tax bill. And on the Republican side, you have Republicans withholding their votes for a variety of reasons, including that they're fearful it might get attached in the future mm -hmm. uh, to that bill. And so I think it's going to be uh, right down to the wire on Thursday. Today, it's a jump ball as to whether this bill passes or not. If you had to put money on it, what do you think is going to happen? Money, I put money on it passing. So I, the $1.2 trillion traditional infrastructure bill, the physical uh, energy, things like that, that you think will pass? I think that passes on Thursday uh, by a handful of votes. Neil? You know, it, um, I, it's going to be $1.2 trillion over an eight-year period. Mm -hmm. When you add in what's already planned at state and local level, we get up to around $2.2 trillion. Over that, I mean, we really are talking about the modernization of the U.S. economy, right? Think of r what rural broadband can do to populations that haven't participated in the prosperity over the last couple of decades. I mean, this is a real forward-looking bill. It's going to lift productivity. It's going to lift living standards. And I think we can grow a little bit faster because of it. You know what's really interesting is the commercial community, the beating heart and soul of the real economy. Neil's constituents, our clients are all for this. Mm -hmm. And when I say for this, I mean, you know, super majorities. It's rare we have any sort of agreement or consensus on anything in this country, but we all want to modernize that economy. And it's really important that this move forward. I hope that um, the political actors in this community don't miss this opportunity because it really is once in a, in a lifetime opportunity in front of us. And you agree it'll pass? Yes. It should. It and will pass. Yes. Where will you see the? Where will businesses see the first impacts? What? Where will the 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 good things from this bill? Where will they show up in real life first? Well, if you if you talk to those who are in the construction industry, they are already working with state departments of transportation and with mayor's offices. So a lot of the money goes to the states and then goes down to the cities. They are already doing planning on what projects that they can finance. Mm -hmm. You will see engineering work done this winter on projects that they wouldn't have been able to afford but for this bill. The engineering will start and you'll start to see some shovels uh, in the ground in the spring and in the summer next year. And what kind of projects? Roads? High Roads, bridges, but everything to, you know, there's uh, about $10 billion here to deal with lead water pipes. Mm -hmm. You know, it's an outrage that, you know, in the United mm -hmm. States today, uh, we have homes and schools and daycare centers where you can't drink the water because it comes through a lead pipe. Mm -hmm. uh, that is going to be replaced. That's a historic investment. It's never been done before. So you're going to see things like that, the broadband that Joe mentioned, uh, but you're also going to see it on ports and water infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You know, out in the Western United States, drought is a new reality the water scarcity issues. This has about $10 billion to invest in improving water efficiency and water storage out west. That's going to make a big difference. And I think one area that will touch almost everybody's lives is the hardening and making more resilient of the energy infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We all know what's happened over the past couple of years. I live in Texas. We had a massive fail last winter. That's simply not acceptable. And this bill will directly address that, and it will show up everywhere, all over the country, and that's a good thing for the economy. Can you uh, give us a, a visual in what kind of ways it will show up? I mean, does this mean we can say goodbye to electric utility poles, or uh, what ways do you think it'll show up? Well, that'll depend where you're at. I'm going to use where I live because it's, it's where I know what's going on mostly because we've all been home for the last mm -hmm. year and a half. Um, wind provides 40% of the electricity in Texas. That's a sort of a, a, a more uh, important fact than I think we, we, we recognized. Um, those wind turbines need to be made more resilient, hardened for greater variability in the weather. It's a very simple thing to address, but having the federal funding there to be able to do it will make it happen. Moreover, what's interesting is we make wind turbines in Texas. We have a manufacturing uh, community behind moving away from fossil fuels towards renewables in Texas. Most people don't know that. Yeah, it's those new opportunities that I think are the most exciting uh, going forward, and people should know about them.
Yeah. That does sound exciting. Um, let's talk about the other bill, the three and a half trillion dollar bill. This is uh, described more as a, a social policy, climate policy bill. The chamber's position on it and why? We're against it. Um, not that there aren't issues that need to be addressed uh, of climate, uh, access to affordable child care for working parents. These are all problems that need to be solved. The approach that's being taken here, though, couldn't be more different than the approach that produced the, the infrastructure bill that we just talked about. So the infrastructure bill began with both parties, Republicans and Democrats, coming together and figuring out what they could find agreement on. Both sides didn't get everything they wanted. Both sides agreed to things that didn't violate their principles, uh, but that weren't on their initial list. And that's how you produce a bill that has 69 votes and that is financed without funding fundamentally, uh, economically devastating uh, tax increases. This bill, on the other hand, there's no attempt at bipartisanship. Uh, instead, it is a collection of proposals that the majority party simply hasn't been able to get through the regular legislative order any other way. And so they've literally taken about 100 different bills, stacked them into one, and then said, what are the tax increases that we need to finance that? And they're pretty hefty tax increases. You know, generally we talk about it and say, well, the corporate rate's 21% and you know, the house wants to go to 26 and a half and maybe it'll end up at 25. Let's look at aggregate revenue collection. Aggregate revenue collection of the federal government from the business sector under the proposal that's currently pending will be 25% higher over the next decade than under current law. And so, you know, for some people, their tax increase is going to be bigger than 25%. For some employers, it's going to be less. But the fact that you're increasing business tax revenue by 25% over a decade, by any way you count it, is a pretty substantial tax increase that's going to have economic consequences. And is that projected 25% increase that businesses would pay? Is that attached to the three and a half trillion dollar three and a half trillion. bill That's specifically? Correct. That's correct. What are your thoughts on this, Joe? Well, um, I mean, it comes down to that. What what do you want, and how much are you willing to pay for it? What would it mean for businesses, both in terms of how much they're going to pay and what they could well, potentially? Well, I think the, the first thing is is that we don't know what it's going to look like yet. I'm waiting till it gets to the Senate Finance Committee, mm -hmm. so I can start thinking about what sort of drag the increase in taxes will cause on GDP. All right, then we're gonna have to look at the mix of the, the federal spending that goes along to see if there's any offset. So just hypothetically, instead of growing at 4% next year, which is our baseline forecast, maybe it's closer to 3.6%, something like that. Um, my sense is that businesses are going to adjust. It usually takes about a year to a year, year and a half after a tax hike for the economy to adjust. It certainly will, will almost, I'm almost certain it'll cause a drag, but right now, I just can't estimate that because we don't know what the composition is yet. And we won't know until the Senate Finance Tax or Senate Tax Committee gets through with it. You know, and, and even then we may not know because yeah. <laughs> at the end of the day, you know, you're talking about every, for this bill to pass, every single Democrat in the Senate has to vote for it and they can't lose more than three in the House. And so we already know that there are several Senate Democrats and several House Democrats who aren't comfortable with the three and a half trillion dollar bill. So we're gonna end up with something much smaller at the end of the day, once we get to kind of those points that we're actually running the numbers. I think Nancy Pelosi has already conceded that it's gonna be smaller than that three and a half uh, trillion number. She has, some of her members haven't conceded that yet, but yes, right. uh, reality is beginning to stare people in the face. So. How should businesses, what are they saying to you, uh, either in the middle market index survey, uh, about their concerns about tax increases, and how can they plan for them? I mean, already in the pandemic, it's been so difficult to plan. It's been so difficult to forecast and model, and you have to be very nimble. So what are you hearing, well, Joe? I think that... You know, they're, they're having to, to prepare for what's going to be a structural change in the tax environment, at least for the next few years. And when, when I talk to clients, they just want to know what's going to happen. And that's the most difficult thing because we just don't know. I agree with Neil. I've never thought that we were going to have a big three and a half trillion dollar reconcil reconciliation bill. You know, maybe about half of that seems about right. And then we can start talking with our clients in a more forward way about how to plan for this. And right now, again, we just don't know, and neither do they, to be honest. Mm -hmm. They being not just our business clients, but the policymakers on the Hill don't know. 
So everybody wants certainty, but there's yeah. a lot of uncertainty still out there. But is it safe to say, well, the taxes are going up? I mean, uh, yeah, uh, in that direction. Uh, it, it is certainly the case that the base scenario is, is that taxes are going up. The question is, is how are they going up and by how much? And so, um, you know, if you look at the, what's been released and agreed, what's been released isn't what's going to eventually become law. But if uh, you're an S Corp, if you're a decent sized S corporation, there's a significant like 15% tax increase uh, when, you, when you add up all the changes that have been included. If you operate internationally um, and uh, you have intellectual property, there's a pretty significant tax increase on, on the international front here. And so uh, those companies in particular uh, are looking at this, trying to understand the extra wallop that they kind of get mm -hmm. under the current proposal. And we'll see if those survive. I think people are beginning to realize the consequences of some of these policies, and hopefully they're gonna be dialed back to something that the economy can absorb, and that's something much more realistic to, to where we need to go to finance the investments that there could be agreement that we need to make. Okay, let's uh, switch gears a little bit and talk about the Fed. Um, we have uh, Fed Chair Powell is going to be testifying this week. We had him speak last week and give us a little bit more color on what's going to happen with the tapering and with interest rates. Um, your take on what he said last week. Okay, so the, the policy rate's going to remain at zero, likely, I think, until early 2023. The Federal Reserve is beginning to slow the pace of their $120 billion per month asset purchase program. They buy $80 billion in treasuries, $40 billion in mortgage-backed securities. It looks, as long as things don't get out of control on the budget, um, the Fed will begin tapering operations later this year. They should proceed at about a withdrawal of $15 billion per month in purchases, and it should end sometime around next July. That will then create a, a buffer space where the Fed can begin preparing the market and the public for modestly higher policy rates. Now, if we go from zero to 25 or zero to 50 next year, that still implies on a real adjusted basis, that's once you adjust for inflation, rates are negative. We're going to be in a very accommodative environment for a long period of time. My sense here is that the Fed will attempt to engineer the most well-telegraphed series of interest rate rises in the history of the United States. <laughs> Nobody will be There'll uncertain be no about what happens. Yeah, yeah. They'll, they'll, they'll actually tell you almost to the day when it's going to happen. Look, the U.S. economy in the first half of the year grew at 6.5%. We're going to grow closer to 5.5% this in the second half, mm -hmm. and I expect around 4% next year. Let me provide some context for you. That's double the long-term trend growth rate of the United States. We're actually doing very well. The unemployment rate is going to fall below 5% at the end of this year and be closer to 4% next year. It's now appropriate for the Fed to end the pandemic era emergency asset purchases. And we're all going to live through this. We, we, we're going to be just fine. You know, our middle market clients tell us that they're expecting the strongest economy in the history of our surveys later this year and into early next year. This is the time to begin to pull back on those emergency actions. Okay, and you're nodding your head. In oh, agreement. absolutely. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's almost as we, we've gotten a distorted sense of, of what's normal, right? Mm -hmm. Like these are extraordinary measures because we are in an extraordinary time. If you want to have extraordinary measures for the next extraordinary yeah. event that we have to deal with, then you have to turn them off when the economy is recovering. And mm -hmm. so uh, Joe's exactly right. This is the perfect time to begin doing that. They are gonna telegraph it well. No one's gonna be surprised. Um, but there are real consequences if they don't go down this road. And that's the other, the other side of this coin, right? They're gonna get the policy right. And if for somehow they got bullied, and they're not going to be, but if somehow they got bullied into holding this back, then that's how we end up making uh, monetary policy mistakes that actually hinder our ability to grow. Mm -hmm. And what do you think would cause the Fed to change its projected direction? Would it be another variant that emerges? I mean, I hate to go to the negative worst case scenarios, but there are still risks okay. that could emerge. What are I'll they? I'll give you three things. A real debt ceiling crisis, an outbreak of a mutated strain inside the, the pandemic, that hits the United States, a very small probability, something around that. And then perhaps a problem in the external sector 
originating out of China, where they've got a oh, they've got a bloated property sector, and they're going to be dealing with defaults inside that sector mm -hmm. probably for the next year. Those would be the three major risks on the table right now. Other than that, they're not going to wait. They're going to begin to pare back that accommodation in the near term. So you can, it's safe to assume for businesses that interest rates will remain low through next year. Not only that, the, in, in the, what's called the summary of economic projections, the Fed's telling us that they expect the terminal long-term policy rate to be about 2.5%. For most of the people who are dialing into this broadcast, that's historically low. And they understand, okay, this is good. This is going to accommodate any lending needs that we need in order to expand our business. And because hiring is going to be somewhat challenging over the next few years, that may involve higher wages, there's going to be some need for financing of more investment in technology, software, equipment, intellectual property in order to increase productivity where you want to use technology as a substitute for labor because labor is just not going to be there. And um, it's in, look, credit availability is not tight. It's very accommodative. And it's in, the fa it's in the interest of the commercial community that it remain that. I want to um, talk about the labor shortages, the supply chain challenges. But before we move on from the Fed, I just wanted to get uh, your thoughts on how uh, the Fed handled the crisis and also the Fed uh, describes inflation as transitory. Mm. Joe, give us your thoughts on uh, whether the Fed uh, got things right and what the direction of inflation is. Okay, so if we were going to give them a grade, I'd give them an A+. Plus. An A+. Plus? Yeah, they responded in a timely, appropriate, and robust manner. In particular, the array of liquidity enhancing programs, whether it be the, the, the PPP or the Main Street Lending Program, all did something that was completely unique, the PPP in, construct, in combination with the Treasury. And I give the, the Trump era Treasury a lot of credit on that. And then the, the Fed really attempted to do something different. Instead of just ring fencing the financial center, which they did, they provided liquidity to other areas of the economy that never had access to uh, the, the Fed discount window. The Main Street Lending Program, 17 billion in assistance was given to firms largely in that revenue bucket of 10 to 50 million dollars 90 percent of it went to the most distressed areas of the economy that really had no relationship with the federal reserve these were very innovative programs that were put forward in a, and again in a very timely manner now inflation we're going through a historic supply shock inflation is going to remain high over the next year to two. I think it's peaked. It will slowly come down, but it's not going to be a, a straight path back to 2%. It's going to be a bumpy road. Those supply chain disruptions aren't going to come back, or aren't going to abate probably until the second half of next year. And we need to go disruption by disruption to talk about it. Um, but the Fed will begin to appropriately tighten monetary policy in a way that's gradual and orderly that businesses can adjust to and the economy can absorb, right? But I think the idea that we are going to talk about inflation as transitory is now in the rearview mirror. Is what? In, in the, the rearview rear view mirror. mirror. We need to talk about it in terms of it's going to be above 2% likely through 2023. It's just so going to be. Inflation yeah. above 2% mm -hmm. for 20, through right. for 2023. Early next year, it'll drop fairly sharply it'll be probably in the, the three to four percent category and then it's going to be a slow grind from there uh neil do you want to give the fed a grade i, I have the feeling you're gonna be a tougher grader maybe i, I would have i would have said a i, I don't know if okay. i would have gotten that's, that's well, about I the same, gone right? a plus yeah. but i would have given an a for for all the reasons that that, that joe just mentioned um and you know uh, the only thing i would add to it is they did it with so little drama um, if you think about our normal responses, you know, we have to go through all this political drama, uh, even sometimes with the Fed in Washington when we have these incidents. Uh, and, and to their credit, they just did what needed to be done and, and executed quickly. Um, you know, I think transitory is in the rearview mirror. Uh, transitory, it, it, looking back on it now, it might have been the wrong word to describe what was happening, right? It, it, it's, it's from a dictionary standpoint, accurate, but it gave people the impression that 
as the U.S. economy reopened, everything was going to reset. Mm -hmm. And it forgot, or it didn't at least telegraph, uh, to, to employers and to consumers uh, that this is a longer period of transitory, that mm -hmm. uh, events well beyond our borders are affecting things here today in the economy that are causing price increases. And um, if there are a couple things we have to avoid, we have to avoid uh, the, the policymakers on Capitol Hill adding fuel to that fire, mm -hmm. uh, either through uh, what they decide to spend or adding fuel to the fire by creating the expectation of even higher inflation in the future. And so, you know, inflation can become a self-fulfilling prophecy mm -hmm. if everyone's convinced it's going to keep going. And so uh, we need to keep the politics out of it and focus on some of the supply chain issues and then get the fiscal policy right on the Hill, avoid the mistakes like a default, and we'll work this thing through. Let's focus on those supply chain issues because that's a huge challenge right now. Uh, we just, you know, a consumer company, Nike, just saying yes. last week that they couldn't uh, get the, the, the things they needed to make the sneakers, so the supply is not there, the price is going up, you know, so, and that now we're going into the holiday season, people are going to be buying things, there's a lot of pent-up consumer demand. Um, let's start with you, Joe, with the supply sure. chain disruptions, uh, describe some of them for me, what businesses are experiencing sure. and talking about and so uh, let, let's hit that one because th that's a really good example the inflation that we've seen is a function of the supply shock not fiscal or monetary policy what are we seeing well it turns out that the little economy of vietnam is a great big cog in the apparel supply chain we're going through the fourth wave of the epidemic right they're going through the first wave they're actually locked down. Their economy is not going to largely reopen until mid-January, they're telling us. Therefore, apparel, uh, footwear, luggage is going to be in short supply around the holidays. Um, Nike simply was telling us something that those of us who follow supply chain closely already knew. And that will cause a shift in the composition of holiday spending. It's not that it's going to be delayed or deferred. It's just going to move from buying goods to more experiential you'll be going to New York or Los Angeles or Phoenix for the holidays rather than buying toys or shoes or, or, or other gifts. Or that car that you can't get. You know. Yeah, well, you're right. Yeah, I had a little bit of experience with that this year. Bought a car in March, didn't show up until September. Why? Lack of, lack of uh, prob excuse me, lack of events, microchips. Turns out the average number of microchips that goes into an auto bill is around 1,000. You ever wondered why the car can uh, parallel park itself on Fifth <laughs> Avenue? It's because of all that technology. All those chips. Yeah. So, so what's your outlook for that? Um, let's talk about just chips to begin with. How long are those shortages going to endure? So we originally thought that the, the constraints would abate later this year. We've now moved that back to early in the second half of next year. So. Based on what we're hearing from the uh, East uh, Northeast Asia, specifically in Taiwan, specifically in South Korea, and then in Northwestern Europe, where they produce actually the most sophisticated chips. It just, it's going to be some time before that abates. It's getting better. Mm -hmm. Chips are more plentiful, um, but it's simply not enough. And of course, here in Washington, you know, there's been a big change, right? We're now going to do industrial policy. Bipartisan supported industrial policy, something that we haven't done in my lifetime. And the only countries that I saw do industrial policy, Japan tried the corner of the market on electronics in the 90s and aughts, failed miserably. Mm -hmm. We've allocated a significant pool uh, of capital to subsidize their basically our jumpstart supply chain, specifically in areas like uh, microchips. So this is going to be a very interesting uh, response function over the next couple of years. We'll see what happens with this. And Neil, what are you hearing from businesses about the supply chain uh, challenges? Have they gotten worse uh, since we last spoke in, in June over the, with the Delta variant? Um, and how long do you um, think they'll endure? And, and how should businesses manage? They have gotten worse. Uh, they, they were getting better as we headed into the summer. I think we've taken a turn for a couple reasons. So you have the outbreak internationally in places like Vietnam mm -hmm. uh, that contribute to new supply chain disruptions that maybe we weren't experiencing then. You also have tremendous logistics challenges. So whether you're talking about you know, container ships, which you know, pre-pandemic 
we had really figured out how to maximize the supply chain system overall, maximizing yep. loading, uh, filling a container box, the maximum number of boxes on a ship, the unloading, the moving them by rail. But the U.S. was not keeping the ports open 24-7 like some other nations so, that, that emerged, uh, I think was a journal article about how so, that's a big challenge. So, well, and some of them weren't operating 24-7 even before. And so mm -hmm. it, you have logistical challenges in getting them unloaded. This ties into the worker shortage. Mm -hmm. So they're having a hard time getting you know, longshoremen to unload. Once you get it off, then if you're putting it on a truck, you got to have somebody to drive that truck. And they can't find enough drivers. They cannot find enough drivers. So you get to the warehouse, that, that truck's got to be unloaded. It usually has to be moved to go to a retail outlet. They don't have enough people in the warehouse to unload. And even you get to retail out, we talk to major retailers, members of ours, who have their store managers coming in at night and unloading trucks because they can't hire the staff to unload the truck that they would normally hire. And so once you start layering these things on, uh, it, the problem kind of compounds on itself. Yeah, and so that's the reason I think it's getting a little worse rather than better. So how do we supply, how do we uh, brainstorm to come up with ideas to solve this labor shortage? Ha raise wages? Uh, what would be your recommendations? How, how are we gonna get through this? <laughs> we're going to have to take a look at the pool of available labor. Um, it involves wages, but it's not, it's not, it's just, not wages. just wages. No, no, no. We are going through a behavioral shock in this economy. People are reassessing their lives after the, the long pandemic, and they're, they're deciding where they want to work, how they want to work, under what conditions. Now, with respect to the supply chain issue, especially around the ports, you know, I've watched the military do the most amazing things in my lifetime. We have real logistical expertise sitting over across the, the Potomac. We ought to talk to them. I imagine they could help us unclog the, the backlog of the 60 ships sitting off the port of LA, Long Beach, in a fairly efficient manner. We just have to be somewhat creative in our policy design around this. Now, there are going to be real long-term issues on the, what I call the workplace transformation. Mm -hmm. Right, there's simply not going to be enough workers for a long time. It involves conversations that are very difficult in this town around immigration, yeah. around uh, underserved populations who are, we're going to have to tap and get them into areas like construction, like manufacturing, like transportation. Um, but we can do these things. We know how, but it's, it's going to take us a couple of years. This isn't going to just lift because the pandemic ends. So if it's going to take a couple of years to fill all these jobs... It sounds to me it would be logical that the supply chain challenges could last. Well, the, the supply chain challenges are because the factories just aren't reopened. And largely that's a non-North American function. It's, it's largely Northeast and Southeast Asia, yeah. where they've got a very different market. They've got a surplus of labor. Those factories will open, right? That's about vaccinations and just public health there. Let's dig yeah. into the labor topic a little bit, because I know you've said this before, Neil. I've, I've seen things you've written. This labor shortage existed way before oh, the pandemic. And then the pandemic hits, and people are working from home or afraid to go to jobs because of the pandemic. Um, so I guess the question is, uh, how much more severe is it uh, since before the pandemic? And... Uh, as far as immigration policy, what needs to be done? Well, it, you're exactly right. Pre-pandemic, um, when you talk to employers kind of across the United States, uh, the, one of their top issues at that time was filling uh, open positions with skilled employees. Um, the pandemic hits. Obviously, labor doesn't become a problem immediately because we shut down the economy. Now that we're reopening, the pandemic effects have exacerbated it in a whole bunch of different ways. So uh, part of it is people reassessing how they want to work. Some of it is people reassessing whether they want to work or not. So if you take a look at you know, people in late stages of their career who figured out that they had the financial well-being to go ahead and retire early, some of them have retired early. If you look at uh, families with school-aged children, uh, even though as schools reopen, 
quarantine requirements, lack of uh, accessibility to affordable child care I mean many of them haven't been able to return uh, to mm -hmm. the workforce. And so there's no single simple reason uh, that we're about two million workers uh, short of where we were pre-pandemic. But the consequences of that is that we have a historic imbalance between the number of open jobs and the number of people who are either looking for work or are marginally attached to the workforce. And so right before the pandemic, we had about one to one, meaning that we had one person and that unemployed or marginally attached for every job opening. We're now at about 0.8 to 0.9 of those people for every open job. And so it's really hard to close that gap unless you grow the labor force. To grow the labor force, we're gonna have to pull people off the sidelines, exactly what Joe was talking about. People who have been even further detached from the workforce are gonna have to be brought in. And we're gonna have to increase immigration. And so uh, at the chamber, we've called for doubling the level of legal uh, jobs-based immigration into the United States. Doubling it. Doubling it. And so that includes both permanent immigration and people here on temporary visas. Mm -hmm. um, we think that would contribute to, uh, to addressing this shortfall. But, you know, demographics are destiny. And, you know, the U.S. is just further behind Japan and Europe in the sense of a declining working age population. And, you've and if we don't address yeah. that, yeah. like there is no amount of pulling people off the sidelines that's going to solve that unless we deal with the demographics. So Tell this us about that, Joe, the this demographic. This isn't the first time in the last 10 years that we've had less than one person available for every job opening. And Neil's right, it's gotten pretty tight, but we've gone through this before. It's the compositional effects of the, of the pandemic that are different. Where we're suffering is in the number of women in the marketplace. It turns out women aged 25 to 54, prime age workers, have borne the brunt of this. They're not returning to the workforce in the numbers that we would have preferred at the turn of the year. It's just simply been delayed, the Delta variant, the schools, available child care. Okay. And I have some theories as to why well, that is, but me, what does your research show When I show talk you? about tapping under, underserved populations, Women can be truck drivers. Women can work in manufacturing. Mm. They can do all sorts of things mm -hmm. that they just simply haven't been given the opportunity. Now, that's going to require a managerial shift in these areas where you need people, mm -hmm. right? And then there is the composition of demand. It ebbs and flows around the, the, the pandemic. Um, in Austin, uh, one of my favorite restaurants simply can't hire enough people and they show up for a few days and then they get a better job. They've had to tap the local high school population, right? And the idea that they're gonna pay uh, somebody $20 to take orders, $20 an hour to take orders, seems a little bit different to them. Mm -hmm. So they're, they're integrating some very sophisticated technology so people can use apps, information kiosks and other things so they can focus on providing the core service, which is the food, right? Mm -hmm. Firms are having to adjust on the fly. It's a very dynamic situation, it's gonna alter the commercial community in ways I don't think we quite can understand yet. So uh, switching to technology instead of needing humans to do it. I even saw at the airport yesterday, I went to buy a coffee. I went through three different computer screens and one human, you know, mm -hmm. but it was all um, instead of having a couple humans to take my order. Um, but I, let's get back to the immigration because I know mm -hmm. that's uh, that issue, you know, just has been talked about for so long. So if the chamber wants uh, some immigration changes, um, how, how soon could those changes go into effect and how likely is it that that would happen? Well, I think you'd be forgiven if you're, if you're an observer of Washington to say, gosh, how could they ever come up with uh, you know, immigration changes? I think uh, if you break down kind of the big immigration bills that people have tried to do in the past and you say, the town is not built for doing an omnibus comprehensive immigration bill. And instead you set your sights on what it would it look like to double the number of H2B seasonal workers. What would it look like, which by the way, we've done before, we did that in the Bush administration on a bipartisan basis in Congress, doubling the H1Bs. I think, I think you can find pathways over the next several years 
for those targeted immigration changes. And so I'm actually bullish. We are, there's already bipartisan legislation uh, in the House. Uh, I think we'll see bipartisan legislation in the Senate that mirrors that. And so we have to build the support for it. Uh, but but this, is, this isn't the possible. This is doable. So in a year or two? You know, I think you probably have to get through the midterm elections. Um, it's really hard for Congress to legislate when it's this closely divided in an election year. Uh, but the, the, I think, as Joe said earlier, th this challenge isn't going to go away next year. It's going to be with us in 2023 and beyond. Mm -hmm. And I think that's going to be ripe for the type of bipartisan agreement that would produce this increase. You know, in let, me, let me tie back to something we were talking about earlier. If you talk to the construction community, mm -hmm. we're going to do this, this uh, trillion dollar infrastructure project. They expect mid mid-process, we're going to be two and a half million workers short. We're going to have to go find them. Now, we can't substitute technology for that in a readily, like you can in the service sector. So the need, the simple economic need, I think at the end of the day, will create the conditions where we'll get that policy change. What that policy change will look like and when it happened, that's Neil's expertise. But I'm absolutely certain the economic needs will demand that change. Let's talk about uh, this related to vaccine mandates uh, in New York, where I'm from. Today, uh, if healthcare workers don't get vaccinated, uh, they lose their jobs by the end of today. And the governor is even talking about bringing in National Guard to assist with health care. So I could see this as going, uh, so you could see it in different ways, but um, the, the vaccine mandate, could it make the labor shortage worse because some people won't get the vaccine and they quit their job. Is the vac what is your opinion of the vaccine mandates? Will it kind of help us get through this pandemic and, and into recovery stronger? Why don't, Joe, why don't you start and then I'll talk well, to Neil. You know, that's a very controversial topic and I'll let Neil adjust the politics of it. On the labor market side, I think that, you know, the more people have vaccines, the better off we're gonna be. And my sense is that on the job, uh, the median worker would prefer that everybody be in a safe environment. And as long as that environment's safe, I don't expect too much displacement in the labor market. All right, Neil? Yeah, it, well, first and foremost, I think where, where Joe led off is exactly where we need vaccinations and we need more people vaccinated, both for public health and for economic recovery. And so if you go back to the, the dangers Joe was talking about earlier, one of them was the potential for a new mutation and outbreak, right? We, we actually have it somewhat in our ability to control that, right? The, the more people we get vaccinated, the more we ch achieve uh, herd immunity, the less likely the chance that we have something that, that can uh, beat our vaccines and breaking out um, uh, into the public health. Um, employers are worried about losing workers. Um, you know, the, the national vaccination rates um, mask stark differences, both within um, uh, local jurisdictions as to what vaccination levels are, and that extends into employment context. So, you know, you have some employers who may have 80% of their workforce vaccinated. You may have some that today, I talked to one earlier today, 40% of his workers are vaccinated. And, what and so they, it's a very yeah. different conversation when you're looking at your workforce at 40% than you are at 80%. And what do they tell you about handling this issue? It must be challenging. You will want to um, have a safe workplace. You want to respect different people's opinions. I mean, what, what do they say about it? The, the person only has 40% vaccinated. That it's a top priority, but it's a difficult thing to navigate. And so, you know, I think, you know, what we're focused on with respect to the vaccine mandates that the, the president announced is we all want to move towards vaccinations. What we don't want to do is make it harder for employers who are already trying to navigate this with their workforce. And so the flexibility to have a policy that moves people towards vaccinations, but doesn't become a kind of a bureaucratic monster that employers have to navigate, in addition to trying to get their workforce vaccinated, uh, is, is key. I remember I wanted to ask you something about uh, an article I read. Uh, so much hiring is done through com the computer now, online sites where the job listings are posted. And um, the article was talking about how some of these job descriptions are so lengthy and detailed and the al algorithms kind of ping people out if they don't have everything in this description. Are you hearing about this? And is that 
maybe part of the problem of trying to match people with jobs? It's a, it's a, it's a huge problem. And in fact, um, uh, the U.S. Chamber Foundation launched a program a, a couple years ago working with the big Internet tech, uh, tech platforms and some of the big job hiring sites. Because in addition to these very long job descriptions, employers tend to use one set of language in describing the skills that they're looking mm -hmm. for and job applicants use a completely different set. Right. And so you actually have a, a, a sorting, a, a inappropriate of sorting people out, both in the algorithm, but also even if you can make it through the algorithm to, a human. And how, to, to employers and employee and potential employees talking to each other. And so um, there's some great work that's being done to come up with common language that helps address that problem. And if you can, if you can remove the friction in those communications mm -hmm. and fix it with the algorithms and the humans, you, we can do a much more efficient job of well, connecting Well, I'll give you a good jobs. example of that, right? Because there, there's always frictions coming out of recessions, right? Labor market frictions are, are, are always more enhanced. But because of the dynamic changes that happened during the pandemic, how we went to go live in the Zoom economy, and that, that, that's now going to define a more sophisticated, technologically-based economy, it's going to become more difficult. Let me give you a real good example. There's a job out there, it's one of the top jobs, it's called cloud engineer. We don't even have a five-digit NAICS code over at the Bureau of Labor Statistics to describe it, yet <laughs> everybody needs one. Uh. Okay, so you get somebody who's in HR, probably not with a tech background, having to write this up. You find it on Indeed.com and you happen to be somebody with a degree in information technology, business, maybe an econometrician, mm -hmm. that's exactly the person they're looking for. Okay, those people aren't going to be using the same discourse. So this is why what the Chamber's doing on this is absolutely critical and crucial. In order to reduce those frictions, we have to be talking a common language. And right now, especially coming out of the pandemic, we're just not. So it sounds like, would you advise businesses to kind of rethink what they're posting as far as job descriptions, try to use more common language? maybe pare down the language a little bit. I mean, not to the extent where you're just saying warm-blooded human <laughs> needed, but well, just something a little bit more um, above a better match. Talk to the young people who work for you. Exactly. They will have a discourse that's more aligned with where you're going, which is we're all turning into technology companies. So talk to the young people in the office that's right. and get they ideas for how to describe start these. Start there. Okay. And then, you know, there's going to have to be a level of sophistication and managerial change. This is one of the challenges coming out of the, the, the pandemic in order to attract and then retain people. Every single business that I talk to, it's basically the, the, the top-notch problem right now. And, you know, is exactly right. Talk to the people you're already employing in that space, but also stop and look at your own initial gating criteria. Does that job really require a college degree? Mm -hmm. um, you know, chances are you may have put that college degree requirement in there back as kind of a gating mechanism when the labor market looked very different than it looks today. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a perfect opportunity uh, and in fact, a necessity to rethink those kind of gating yeah. requirements. Or maybe if there's a 10-year gap in the resume, maybe there's a good reason. The yeah. person was home taking care of elderly people or children or... Exactly yeah, I think right. even the chamber has something on it, the website about uh, post-prison uh, employment. Second chance hiring. So, um, you know, people who've paid their debt to society, um, we, should be, we, we should not automatically be screening them out from potential uh, uh, job openings. Okay, uh, big uh, uh, shift here. I want to talk about China. Um, we've got the Evergrande crisis. I want to ask Joe how you think that's going to play out. But in the overall um, perspective, a broader perspective, there appear, it appears the Chinese government is making big societal changes. It's clamping down on everything from how many hours students play video games uh, last week Crypto, private cryptocurrency trading was banned. So what does this mean for U.S. businesses exposed to China? And how do you see Evergrande, um, which got the markets very nervous last week, how do you see that and playing so out? Ever, Evergrande's a symptom, not the cause. Okay, what's going on around Evergrande is that we have an overbloated Chinese property sector that now needs an adjustment. Investors are going to be taking a haircut. This won't be, this is not the first default out of China, and it won't be the last. Uh, Evergrande will probably continue royal markets every once in a while until the Chinese government, that's the fiscal 
authority, the monetary authority, and the regulatory authority decide what to do. My sense is they're going to break that up and do a bad bank and a good bank. Where the good debts are, they'll be paid off. Where the bad debts are, they'll have to restructure those, and that'll be a 30-year process. My sense is there's something going on inside China that we don't understand. It probably has to do with an inability to raise revenue because of a profound state and local debt problem. And it looks to me as if the Chinese political authority is trying to assert control as they deal with a long-term structural adjustment in Chinese growth and activity. I think in many ways we've made too much about China. It's not the economy we think it is. Sure, there's going to be some long-term challenges, but I'm more worried about the structural adjustment that's likely to occur in China as opposed to the lateral challenge to the United States or, or Western Europe. You know what? In 1865, this country stood basically in ruin. By 1905, we were the economic superpower. But on that 40-year journey, we went through a couple depressions, a silver panic, a financial panic. China's not going to go from economic backwater to number one economy in the world without a couple hiccups. And this is going to be a little bit of a challenge for them. Are you hearing from businesses about concerns about their relations with China, exposure to China? No question. And so, you know, whether in particular that kind of this latest round of kind of social crackdowns, like, mm -hmm. you know, um, the the political debate around China tends to uh, lag what's actually happening. And so, you know, the political debate, we still treat it like, you know, it's a manufacturing place and it's the only place for, for manufacturing when manufacturing is already moving out of it's China already, to other places. Yeah. The real question is the middle class, right? And so a growing middle class population who want to buy middle class goods and services. The great unknown question is, is, you know, in a social credit system where they're telling people how long they can play video games online and all the other kind of social crackdowns you see, I don't know what that market looks like. And I think for U.S. companies trying to figure that out, I think it's in many ways a big black box. So are you saying that for U.S. businesses uh, that were manufacturing in China, Everyone's going out the door if they haven't gone through the door a, already. I wouldn't say they all are, but, everyone, yeah, but, but yeah, that's I mean, the, 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 trend. the trend is already moving. That and direction. then they're going to like Vietnam, which is now shut down because of mm -hmm. COVID and things like that. But then there, uh, so maybe the more um, you know, issue now is how if I'm selling to China, I got to really keep a close eye on what's going on there because yeah, if, I, if, if I'm a video game manufacturer or involved in that business and they're cracking down on how many hours a student can yeah. play, that Companies could really today affect my are business. not looking at China as a source of manufacturing. They're looking at it as a, as a, a market, consumer. A, con, a consumer source to sell. And you know that's a very different environment that we're about to face um, you know, for all the issues that you mentioned and that Joe mentioned. And I, you know, I, I think we're going to go through a few more twists and turns mm -hmm. before we see what the pathway is out. Okay, great. Okay, so I lost the clock for a second. Sorry about that. I'm a little bit behind on getting in the attendees' questions, so let's get right to it. And uh, we've got a whole bunch of questions. Let's work through these. Uh, okay, so how does the U.S. economy support the high production needs when the global production markets are failing due to the COVID impact on international production, uh, tightening the supply chain? So can, can the U.S. economy, can, all the stuff that's produced overseas, which is now not being produced or backlogged, can, does the U.S. have the ability to do it in-house? The ability over the medium to long term, yes. In the near term, we just don't have ready substitutes. For example, the disruption of, say, footwear production, mm -hmm. Nike. Okay, they choose to produce things in Vietnam. Well, we have a readily substitute in North America that would be called Mexico. Can that be done quickly? No, it, it, it can't. It's very challenging. So there's not that interoperability on supply chains that, in a way that people talk about, it's just not realistic. My entire career arc, we've talked about reshoring, onshoring, and all that. It's never happened. I'm not expecting it to happen anytime soon or perhaps ever. Which is all the more reason that we also need to think about vaccinations, not just here, yes. but globally. It is in our national security interests, in our economic interests, in the U.S. global leadership interests to be a leader in helping the world get vaccinated. Helping other countries get vaccinated as well. 
Okay, uh, a question. Uh, as we begin preparing budgets for 2022, how much inflation should we factor in and should we assume interest rates will be higher? We talked about this a sure, bit earlier. Sure, interest rates are going to be marginally higher. You should expect somewhere between 35 and 4% inflation in 2022 and then moving back to 2% in 2023 and 2024. Okay. Um, Neil, we'll, uh, this one can go to you. What is the economic impact of threatened increases in income taxes? <laughs> Well, um, if, if you look at the, all the tax increases that are being proposed, uh, interestingly, perhaps the most modest is on uh, restoring the top individual tax rate uh, to, to where it was pre-2017, so you know, a little less than three-point increase, uh, leaving aside the, the surtax on over $5 million in income. I think from an economic standpoint, what we want to look at is that in combination with limitations on the 20% exclusion for pass-throughs. And so, you know, this gets to the S-Corp issue I mentioned earlier and some of the impact there. And then I think you want to look at the corporate side uh, and some of the impacts of some pretty substantial tax increases, uh, particularly on companies that operate internationally. So that's definitely something to plan for. You know, the, um, how this shakes out economically will depend on U.S. households. U.S. households are sitting on in excess of $2 trillion in savings that they've piled up. That's going to, in my, from my point of view, largely define the narrative over the next couple of years, how that gets spent and where it gets spent. Agreed. Uh, Joe, what other options would the Fed have to get high inflation under control, short of bursting the historical debt and asset bubbles that are everywhere? Okay, well, that's an interesting question. The Fed's not in charge of fiscal policy. <laughs> All it can do is set the policy rate. It can engage in some other policies uh, around risk taking. Um, but my sense is, is that inflation, since we think it's already peaked, is not going to be a 1970s style challenge. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> the better analogy might be what happened after the war, World War II, when we lifted price controls and wage controls. We had a year and a half period of very high inflation that came right back to the trend. So can you walk us <coughs> through that dynamic, how that happens? Sure. Um, so you, you think inflation has peaked, mm -hmm. and so it's not going to get out of control like in the 1970s. So walk us through a little bit what that looks like, how inflation starts to subside. Okay, well, the supply chains reopen. Their goods become more readily available. Investment begins to increase. Right now, when we talk to the public and they say, my God, inflation, they're not really talking about the same thing that the business people on this broadcast are. What they're talking about is gasoline prices. Mm -hmm. Businesses are worried about how much, is the, how much the chip microchips cost. Can I get wood to build this house? What am I paying? I'm building a house in Austin. I met with my construction manager last Friday. He told me that they're going to basically cancel some of the contracts for the bulk purchases they made last year when prices of wood were very high, prices of wood have come off by 70%. The piece of plywood that last year cost $70 is now 17 at, at Lowe's. They're just gonna go buy it from Home okay. Depot and Lowe's, right? Unfortunately, PVC piping, all-time historical high price. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit more difficult to get. It's just gonna be an uneven process. The supply chains are going to dictate in the near term what's going to happen with inflation. The Fed, though, over the medium and the long term, will determine what happens via monetary policy, because monetary policy in the near term is going to become tighter. And we would expect, as the pandemic recedes, we'll see the federal funds rate go from zero back to 2.5%, and that'll take a number of years. But that will largely shape the environment. Okay, last thing. You know, if you're in a business in the economy of scarcity, it's manufacturing, the production of goods. You've got a different world than if you were in a business in the economy of abundance. That's the economy of technology, life sciences, services. Because that's where the majority of the economy is. The Fed thinks that the longer term trends, the price is actually falling, or being net, to, net to zero improvements in quality, will reassert itself after we move through what's a historic supply shock. Neil, what are the sectors that are most concerned um, about inflation because they don't have the pricing, the ability to pass the price on easily to their consumer? So 
they have to absorb it and it affects their margins. Who are you hearing from the most on that well, issue? We're hearing most from small businesses. So, um, you know, when we look at, at the small businesses, 70 percent uh, are complaining about rising input prices and an inability to pass those along. And so, um, you know, if, if you're small, you may not be able to cancel. The, you may have not ever had a bulk order. Yep, and you may right. not have the ability to cancel that bulk order. And so it's more difficult for them. Um, you know, it's uh, again, this is an input problem. Yep. And so um, if, if you were in construction, if you were a small home builder who didn't do bulk orders, you had huge input problems. Um, you know, today, if you are because of the labor shortage, as you're raising prices to get to try to get uh, the, the mm -hmm. high school server at twenty dollars yeah. uh, at, at Joe's restaurant, um, that's putting pressure. And so it's, yeah. it's those things. And it it really cuts across more than industry. It's it's your price. I want to underscore what Neil said there. It really is a, a challenge for firms with less than 10 people who work for them that have less than 10 million in revenues. They bore the burn of the adjustment during the entire pandemic. That's where the damage is, which is why the Fed really wants to address this now rather than later. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time, but it was a great discussion. Thank you so much, Neil. Thank you, Joe. I really enjoyed it. And thank you, all the attendees, for participating and sending in your questions. Uh, we have a poll where we'd like you to answer questions about what you'd like to hear about next quarter in our next uh, program. Thank you for joining us. This has been The Real Economy.